Good day. This is Alex Bainbridge. Welcome to the Green F Show. Recently, I had the chance to sit down with Rima Naji, who is a uh, leading activist in the Palestine Solidarity Campaign in Maganjan, Brisbane, and also a recently announced Greens candidate for the seat of Morton in the federal election coming up next year. We had a great discussion. More about that in a sec. Before we get underway, I do want to acknowledge that this show is being recorded on stolen First Nations land. It always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Also, if you like the work that we do, please do become a Green Neft uh, supporter. It is the number one way to both support the work that we do, plus to receive the content that we produce. Plans start from just $5 a month, but you can also uh, donate more if you like. It's a, as I said, it makes a big difference to our work. Rima and I had a great discussion talking about some of the issues associated with the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, her decision to run for the Greens, some of the issues in Australian politics, more broadly than just Palestine, uh, the pathways towards decolonisation. It was a great interview. Take it away now. I personally am very pleased to be here with um, Rima Naji, who is a Greens candidate for Morton and also a leading activist in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. I'm wondering if you would like to maybe just say a few words to introduce yourself to a Green Left audience. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much for being here today, Alex. I'm really glad that you're here. Um, so as you said, I'm one of the leading activists at um, Justice for Palestine, Maganjan. I'm also a mum and I'm a University of Queensland staffer and um, I'm a local here in the in the electorate of Morton. I've been a local for the past eight years. I've lived in different places, including Annerley, um, Yoronga, even at the um, southern part of the electorate Pallara, and now Terragendi is um, what I call home and where I'm raising my family. This genocide in Gaza is such an overwhelming uh, feature of the of the current situation that we're in, and we've now gone 12 full months. It just feels so staggering that we have gone 12 full months uh, of this genocide. I'm wondering if you could make some comments about, I guess, your experiences as part of this campaign. And also, what do you think it says about contemporary capitalist society that we've got governments like Australia and the United States um, not, only, not only willing to be complicit, even actually co-perpetrators of this genocide? What, what are your comments about that situation that we face, that we're, that we're in? Yeah, thanks very much for this question. It is, it's been a strange experience. Um, on the one hand, this is the first time in my life that I see people interested in our stories and I see thousands of people turning up to rallies. I used to MC Palestine rallies in the city in the past and we'd be lucky to have a hundred people turning up. Now we have thousands of people marching the streets calling for justice and liberation of the Palestinian people. So this has been something great to see. But on the other hand, my people will have to suffer have to be obliterated, they have to be starved, and they have to be ethnically cleansed for my voice here to be heard. So it's been a strange experience, to be honest. And I have to say that organizing with Justice for Palestine Maganjan has been one, one way of dealing with that generational trauma that I inherited from my um, parents. Um, so I, don't Im I can't imagine myself being able to um, continue and keep going with our organizing within Justice for Palestine. It's been one way of dealing with those really difficult emotions because it hasn't been easy to deal with all of these things. I still remember the first time I organized or I've been involved in organizing um, for Palestine. It was in the year 2000, I was um, in Jordan and that was when uh, Mohammed al Dura was um, killed right behind his father. I still remember watching this in disbelief and going, um, I was so confused and I was going, well, how come he was behind his father? And for me at the time, I was, um, I think I was in grade six or something. So um, father was for me safety. So if he was behind his father um, who was begging the Israeli soldier to stop because there's a kid right behind him to stop shooting and that wasn't enough for them to stop shooting and then he ended up you know, like a lifeless corpse on his on his father's lap. That shocked me and confused me. And um, the very next day when I went to school, I refused to go um, to go to the classroom. And I thought, no, we're not going to the classroom. There's something wrong is happening. And that was when other um, my classmates were like, yeah, we're not going. We're not going inside. 
we need to sit, we need to, and that was our first, you know, like it wasn't a strike in, this, in the real sense of a strike, but it was almost one because we were joined by other um, students who, were, who shared the same, um, maybe confusion, uh, frustration, and anger, and we sat, refused to go to the classroom, and we ended up marching from our school. So that was when I was first um, involved in organizing for Palestine. And then 24 years later, well, I'm still shocked. This is still happening and it's getting worse. So we got to ask ourselves here, what's happening? How come this is still going on? And it's because Israel is acting with impunity. It's all thanks to, you know, like our capitalist system. It's all thanks to the imperialist West, such as the US, the US and its allies, including Australia, because they were, fa they were faced with a reality and they had a choice to make between human rights and profits, which is what capitalism is about, you know, like um, increasing the line of production to increase profits for certain, um, you know, corporations or very few um, or, or wealthy people. They chose profits over human rights. And this is what we're seeing right now. Yeah. I mean, continuing on that front, I mean, I feel like it is very striking when you have the people like Penny Wong and Anthony Albanese um, railing against uh, quote-unquote terrorism or whatever else. But you think, well, exactly what kind of liberation tactics do they support for Palestinians? And it's even like you think back to the Great March of Return, where Israel is literally sniping at peaceful protesters. But where's the condemnation of that? Like there are no tactics that the West will allow for liberation for Palestine. That, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Especially with the Great March of Return. I mean, there were people who posed no threat to the heavily armed Israeli soldiers who were sitting at the other side of the fence. But that was normalized as well, which allowed for a genocide at this scale to happen. I mean, look at Lebanon now. How, how come? There is no, you know, like all that narrative around the hostages. Or, there, there are no hostages over there. There is no Hamas over there. And even Hezbollah was, was created in response to the Israeli threat to, to Lebanon. And the first attack that they, um, you know, that they launched when they exploded those, when, um, at the device explosion, I mean, those are civilian devices. Mm. And they literally weaponized them. Mm. And we saw some media outlets reporting about it with a celebration tone. How is this possible? Where is the accountability? Yeah, it's really, it's really horrible. Um, now, obviously, in addition to um, your involvement in Justice for Palestine, you're also a committed trade unionist and now running on the Greens platform, which includes housing justice and climate action, things like that. I'm wondering if you could make any comments about uh, any links you might see between some of these issues. It's one word, injustice. Um, there's climate injustice, there's housing injustice, there's disability injustice. And if we look at all of these things that, you know, the thread, it's the injustice. And there is a deep psychological, you know, like connection that binds people from all backgrounds who might not share the same experiences, but what binds them is actually the, um, that generational suffering as a result of colonialism. And also not only people reject colonialism, also land rejects colonialism, which is what we're seeing right now. All that climate change, all the things that we're seeing is our mother earth rejecting colonialism. So it's this injustice happening all across the board. And what the Greens are fighting for, or what I'm personally fighting for, even before, before joining the Greens is we actually need to talk about justice here. And I remember one of the things that um, the Palestinian author, Azmib Shada, once said in his book, Palestine Matters of Truth and Justice. He said that Palestine is not a dilemma awaiting creative policy solution. It's a matter of injustice awaiting the application of justice. And I believe that this applies in different settings as well. And I know you've spoken about um, the links between grassroots activism and electoral representation. I'm wondering if you could talk more about that. Yeah, sure. So um, I believe that grassroots activism expands the possibilities of electoral politics. Um, 
what happens in grassroots activism is that we are we are building alliances with grassroots organizations. So that's represented by um, unions, um, ordinary people, uh, small businesses, even media outlets. And, you know, every organization, as I see it, is a tool to achieve the change that we are hoping to achieve. Um, so with grassroots, with these links, this is how we um, build that coalition that puts pressure on our political system in order for them to be accountable to us, the people, and to grassroots organization. See, um, people, people, we got to ask ourselves, why is it that people feel disfranchised from the political landscape in the, in the first place? Um, it's because this system thrives on the passivity of the many. It thrives on people trying to make ends meet, thrives on people, you know, um, busy doing, I don't know how many jobs in order to keep a roof above their heads and feed their children and um, not having um, the time or the energy to participate in, um, you know, our democratic process. And that's, th that's um, through grassroots activism. So I'm one who believes that grassroots activism is not just one. There's no one avenue and there's no one um, way of doing things, even those who are time poor and who are unable to go out and march in the streets, there are other avenues for them to participate and put pressure on our political establishment. And that's through so many ways, like petitions, um, even voting, making the, their votes matter. For me, I felt that at a point, I know that as a marginalized woman, I used to think, and this is how we've been conditioned to think, is that what we have is the best we could have. Um, but once I unlearned this, I felt liberated and I thought, you know what, not only do I vote, I'm also going to run as a candidate because we're done by our communities being marginalized and not being heard. I was speaking with one of the um, people in the Rohingya communities and he told me, I just want someone to mention the word Rohingya in parliament. I mean, there's a genocide happening there and it's, it's gotten worse. And people are not talking about it. Our people in parliament aren't even mentioning this word. And there are hundreds of these people who are feeling very isolated. And we got to ask ourselves, is it their fault they feel isolated? Is it their fault they're not willing to integrate in the, in the broader um, or the wider Australian society? It's because they feel unseen, unheard, and there is a pressure on them to assimilate. This needs to end. Everyone has the same right to be represented, to be heard, to be acknowledged. There is no one with a privileged view of who gets to have a hierarchy of concerns here. No, we are all equal. And this is one of the things that I want to center in this campaign is each single person, especially marginalized communities who really feel like literally marginalized. They're not even allowed to be, um, to be a part of this democratic process for for whatever reasons i mean we're seeing the media complicit whenever we raise our voices we get um, portrayed as um, the angry people um, disruptive etc when what we're doing actually we, we tried everything i was a member of the labor party so um, you know i leafleted i door knocked i campaigned for you don't tell me i have not done anything i've been active in the political sphere for years and I've done everything by the book and you're still ignoring my voice. Enough of this, enough of it. I've unlearned all of these things that I was conditioned to believe. I wanted to ask you specifically about the media and I'm, I'm very conscious um, several weeks ago that Sarah Ferguson um, hosted a very um, hostile, in fact, you might even say vicious interview with uh, Max Chandler Mather. And then two weeks ago, 7.30 had a report uh, which featured you um, uh, about the Greens supposedly being too radical. It's obviously not just the ABC, but it definitely includes the ABC. I, I guess the way I'm looking at this there, you've got the establishment media is trying to discipline or tame the Greens to be, you know, quote unquote, less radical or, or whatever, or, or else to sort of drive a wedge between 
um, between you know, more moderate and more radical sections of the Greens. And now just in recent days, we've had this whole phenomenon of like, you know, the media getting all excited and suddenly paying attention to Palestine rallies for the first time in months um, because maybe somebody's waving a Hezbollah flag, but they pay zero attention to it. Well, is maybe the Australian government complicit in the genocide? They just don't even pay attention to that. So I'm wondering if you could make some comments about the media and how you'll be relating to that in this campaign. Look, we're challenging the status quo. Uh, we are shaking the system and we're telling people that this incremental politics, this is rubbish and we deserve better than this. And I understand that this is not going to be welcomed by open arms. So, um, but at the same time, I won't be, be sucked into that narrative. And I think one of the things when I think about um, our media, especially mainstream media, um, it's no longer about what you say about me and about my cause. It's what we're saying about you and your role as mainstream media with huge influence. What are you doing to make sure that a genocide is not normalized in our society? What are you doing to make sure that the voices that are actually calling for peace and justice are not criminalized or portrayed as um, disruptive? It's their responsibility as mainstream media that for some way they try to distract and um, um, I think it's one way of them avoiding responsibility and that's why they keep it, they, they distract, they talk about um, Hezbollah flags, but hang on a second, you need to stop there and tell me what are you doing? What's your role in all of this? How come um, genocide is normalized? How come you're talking about flags and you're not talking about the tens of thousands of people who have been killed and murdered, um, maimed, starved, ethnically cleansed? Where is your responsibility? So I think they have a huge role to play here. And they're not taking responsibility. I, I want to finish up by asking about um, colonialism. I mean, I think settler colonialism is very clearly a, a big aspect of this genocide uh, in Gaza and now obviously can, you know, expanding beyond even the borders of quote-unquote Israel. Um, I, I guess that brings up the question of decolonization, which a lot of people talk about, but I, I feel like perhaps it would be good to actually put a bit, bit more flesh on the bones about what that means. So I'm wondering if you could share any visions you might have about what decolonization might look like, both in Palestine, but also in this country. Yeah, that's an excellent question, actually. Um, Israel is a, is a settler colonial project, and um, it's, it's settler colonialism, which is a specific feature of colonialism. Um, so the difference is, with settler colonialism, it's all about the displacement and replacement of the indigenous population or the native population, that, and that's what Zionism is about, pretty much. But with colonialism, so pa Palestine used, was colonized by the British before, but it was not settler colonialism. They did not resettle people to live in Palestine. Um, but what the, what the Israelis have done is that this whole Israeli project is about um, displacing Palestinians to make way and change the um, composition of the society there. So when we talk about decolonialism, it's very important in the context of Palestine is to acknowledge that Palestinians have the right to return home. When we talk about it in broader sense, um, decolonialism acknowledges indigenous ways of life because we've been for or certain ways of, of lives of life have been forced on indigenous people under the banner of civilization. Um, decolonialism includes centering indigenous knowledge in our schools and education systems so that indigenous people are telling their own history by themselves rather than our stories being narrated by our colonizers. Um, decolonialism acknowledges that indigenous people have been denied the right to self-determination, denied the right to practice our own culture on our own land. So once we acknowledge these things, we'll be able to liberate ourselves and decolonize in, in the real sense of decolon decolonialism. So it starts but with, um, you know, you and I, Talk and having these conversations and spreading um, the, these, this knowledge um, amongst our own circles. And one of the things that really strikes me, like we keep talking about wealthy societies, wealthy societies. Well, you know what? Ethical societies aren't necessarily wealthy societies. 
And if we look at, you know, like those ethical practices, they're not necessarily um, based on um, wealth. Look at those indigenous communities. I mean, we've created something that all this, you know, like money and all of these, you know, like buildings cannot create, and that's caring for one another. That's why ethical societies can be manifested by a small village in Africa, not here in our civilized, um, you know, Australia where everyone has a role within that village has a role and we understand our roles and we care for each other so the young care for the um the old they are i mean look at what we have here we have um aged care we have um domestic violence these are all um results of colonialism but if we look at how ethical societies function we actually care for each other and we should bring this knowledge back and center it in our system center, we need a cultural shift, shift and this will not happen overnight. But I think people are starting to realize that what we're building is actually not enough to, to sustain us. It's the relationship, it's the culture of care that sustains us as communities. And this is what indigenous knowledge is about. It's caring for the environment so that the environment can care um, for us. This reciprocity of care um, amongst all living creatures, and we're not seeing this. I mean, look at the um, the environment. Look at uh, what the government is doing. They're still opening new coal and mine, mine projects when it's clearly the damage that's been done is irreversible, and we're still opening new. Like, w what are we expecting? There is there is no end to this colonial um, mentality. It feels like we're just thinking about the here and now and the profits and not thinking about the next generation. This is a colonial mentality. What am I going to leave for my children? A dying planet where people are fighting with each other on finite resources? This is so dystopian. And all things that we've watched on our TVs about, you know, like um, the future and the dystopian stories, they're actually happening right now. And this really dis disturbs me. So for me, it starts by making sure that those indigenous ways of life are not alienated and we need to bring them front and centre. Well, um, thank you very much for your time this morning. Is there anything else that you want to say before we finish up? Thank you, Alex. And um, I know the decision to put my hand up as a candidate was not easy. Um, I mean, as you mentioned, um, I'm an activist within Justice for Palestine, again, Jen, and I'm committed to this cause. I'm also a mom. I'm committed to my children, two children. I'm committed to my job at um, the University of Queensland, and um, that also takes a lot of my time and energy. So to to add this responsibility um, was not an easy decision for me, but I thought it was a necessary decision because enough of of our communities um, feeling marginalised, um, and I feel that we do need representation and we do need accountability in our um, political system. So, um, yeah, I just thought that, and I just want to end on this, actually, this story. I was speaking with a, an elected representative um, from the Labour Party um, not long after the genocide started. And one of the things that he said to me was, um, was this, he said, do you really think that we can make a difference? And that really stayed with me. And I was thinking about it when I, like all the way home, going, what, what, where are you trying to inspire? Saying, you know, like <laughs> these words. And, and on, it came to me when I got home and I went, it's pointlessness. You're trying to inspire pointless, pointlessness that whatever we do, there's nothing we can achieve. And that, to me, that was a turning point going, if an elected representative thinks that we can't achieve anything and that all we can do as, um, as, like, as Australians is to take the back seat in an international arena, then you, you need to go. You need to move out of the way and allow for another generation of people who have the power and have the willingness to actually make things better. Well, thank you very much, not only for your time, but also the positive vision and the inspiration that you uh, invoke. Thank you. Um, so I personally would be very happy to be supporting your campaign and to encourage other people to do so as well. Thank you, Alex. Um, Thanks yeah. for the opportunity. Thank really appreciate time. you. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Well, that brings our interview with Rima to an end. 
Uh, I'd like to thank Rima for taking the time to, to, to join us today. I'd like to thank you for checking out the Green F show. Uh, please do, um, if you like the work that we do, please do become a Green F supporter if you're not already. As I said at the beginning, it is the number one way to support our work. But also you can help us out in a number of ways. You can give this video or podcast a thumbs up or a five star review. You can tell your friends about it, share it on social media, help build the audience for the Green F show. Uh, we would love to have your support in whatever way makes sense to you. Uh, there are plenty of actions coming up in the solar Palestine Solidarity Campaign and on other issues. Uh, we're promoting also the rising tide blockade of the world's largest coal port um, coming up in November. Um, check out all those things and more on the Green F website or in the Green F delivered to your door when you become a supporter. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time on the Green F show.